Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming on such a cold night. Uh, there's a lot of competition. Everybody's out saving or preserving something in Concord tonight. So particularly from West Concord, uh, they have a big shootout on Warner's Pond. So we're delighted to have your company. I'm Brian Rossborough. I want to thank, before we start, uh, Laura Miller, who's on her first occasion as a camera person, pressure, pressure. And, and Barbara Berlusi, Berlusa, who is the director of programs for the Friends of the Library. And of course, Sherry Litback, who's not here, but uh, we're giving us a warm room. Uh, my association with Peter uh, and the inspiration for tonight goes back 40 years. Uh, I, I was struggling to make a living at a group called Earthwatch. Uh, we were funding scientists who were studying rocks, stars, plants, animals, people in their ruins. Uh, and I uh, had to move the organization and I fell in love with a site that you all know, the Public Theater with an X on Soldiers Field Road. It has a moat around it that sort of dried up. And uh, I came up with this idea that I need somebody to tell me what, can, what to plant on this moat uh, so that when people come, they can wander around and enjoy it. And so either through a book or through a friend of a friend, I uh, found Peter Del Trinity and he came. And not only did he tell me what to plant around the moat, but he walked me for an hour and a half up and down Soldiersville Road and introduced me to every tree, every plant, every bush, and every weed. And I realized he's not only talented, terribly gene, uh, generous. And 30 years later, I'm now living in Concord, and I all of a sudden have a twitch about the fact that we're losing canopy slowly. And, uh, and so I talked to the people who are in charge of all of that, and uh, I, I, I realized that uh, all of us love our trees, but we know 50 movie stars and 25 baseball players, and. 30 this and that, but we can't name the four trees in our front yard. So I called Peter and asked him, could you give me a list? This is out of the blue. After 35 years, can you give me a list of trees that will last 100 years? And that list is in what you're sitting on. Uh, uh, and, uh, and enclosed is a handout of his latest list of things that you in New England, we in New England, might consider planting. Uh, and so take those home with you. Uh, uh, five years after that, uh, uh, I came along and we got very interested in uh, trying to encourage tree planting. And that's what tonight's uh, talk is about. Uh, everybody wants to plant more trees, how to go about it, how to go about it purposely and, and, and whatnot so that your community becomes uh, akin to an arboretum uh, was of great interest to me. So once again, I called on Peter, and here he is uh, to tell us what other towns have done. And so that would be of interest, particularly to people in the room um, uh, who are on the permanent memorial committee for our 250th, because uh, they've taken up that challenge. Uh, Peter began in Mar uh, and. Marin County, yeah, and I asked him, uh, how did you get attached to trees? And he said his mother got him involved in drip watering his neighbor's lawns. He said, all I had to do was move the hoses. And, uh, but uh, uh, after moving seven or eight hoses, uh, he made enough money to do whatever he wanted to do with that. And he left. California, came here, and as you, uh, some of you know, for 35 years was a senior research scientist at our Arnold's Arboretum, uh, a curator of their living collections. He published the uh, Arnoldia, which is the, the paper and the publishing, and uh, has uh, become uh, committed uh, to, um, the growth and health of trees, and particularly uh, in climate change, uh, urban trees, uh, and has written uh, quite a few science, uh, science scientific papers, 
on trees from Japan, from China, uh, hemlocks, stewardia, and if you have a weakness for ginkgo trees, he's the guy uh, to talk to. And tonight, uh, uh, I think we're going to uh, get a, a brief overview from Peter Del Tredigy. So it's, the room is yours, sir. All right, thank you, Brian. dim the lights a little bit. Um, you might be able to see the slides a little better. Um, just one correction. I grew up in California where it doesn't rain in the summertime and so I my mother got me involved in watering people's gardens and we just she taught me how to use a hose moving on drip irrigation but not for lawns. It was for their trees and shrubs. So I could just move hoses around and I could water you know, seven or eight gardens simultaneously. So that's something that kept me in very good stead, uh, you know, later on in life. So can everybody hear me now? Just make sure, okay. Now, I had to, you know, I, have a, I had a lecture that I used when I was teaching at the design school on street trees, and you know, I've modified it to, and the students were from all over the world, so I had lots of examples of different street trees, but. Uh, I had to modify this talk to make it appropriate for Concord, which uh, of course is why I'm showing you this image from Los Angeles. So there's a few remnants uh, of my original lecture from different parts of the world, but I'm trying to make this talk as relevant to the issues that you are facing uh, here in Concord. Now, I start with this slide, because this is an iconic image of Los Angeles. These Mexican fan palms were planted in the 1930s. And about five years ago, the city of Los Angeles banned the planting of any more Mexican fan palms uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is they don't provide any ecological services. They don't provide shade, they don't know anything about water. And when it, it holds its leaves for you know several years, they each single leaf weighs about five pounds, and when the tree sheds that leaf and it falls and it hits your car or it hits you, it can do some very serious damage. So the city has to climb those trees and prune the leaves off before they all drop. Uh, and then finally, of course, they're a bit of a fire hazard when the Santa Ana winds are blowing, uh, if they're nearby and the embers get uh, up in that crown, they go up like matchsticks. So the reason I'm telling you this story is that what seemed like a good idea 100 years ago or 90 years ago, all of a sudden you have to adapt to the new conditions that you're now facing. So these trees, you know, they're iconic now in Los Angeles, but in another 20 years you probably won't see any of them anymore. Now, uh, speaking of iconic trees or trees that uh, sort of uh, create the character of the place you're in, for New England, nothing does that better than the sugar maple. And of course, there you can see the old-fashioned way of collecting maple syrup in buckets. I don't think I've seen anybody doing this for quite a while. Everybody now uses vacuum tubes and pumps, uh, and they literally suck the sap out of the trees. But nevertheless, the sugar maples are still there, and they still, you, when you drive down these country roads, you know you're in New England when you see this. And uh, in the city, like, you know, Boston, uh, Commonwealth Avenue is uh, defined, you know, you mentioned that by these magnolias, these saucer magnolias that bloom, uh, you know, early in the spring. And what's interesting, of course, this is not a native plant, but it defines the character of Commonwealth Avenue. And these were all planted during the 1950s when a single woman said, I want to plant some trees that this is when Commonwealth Avenue was sort of run down, property values were, were, were dropping, and she convinced her neighbors that if they each contributed $25, they would get a tree planted in their yard, and she wanted them all to be the same kind of tree, all saucer magnolias. This is on the uh, south-facing side, and on the north-facing side, they, they got a uh, Cornus Florida. American dogwood and they were all planted by MIT students who volunteered so this is one woman's vision that essentially defined the character of the place other examples uh, near the Arnold Arboretum these red oaks 
a quadruple <laughs> row of red oaks were planted uh, by Olmsted in the 1890s, and they really defined that whole stretch from Jamaica Plain all the way down to the Forest Hills uh, subway station. And you know they're beautiful at all times of the year. But what's really what people, a lot of people don't realize, they see these red oaks and they say they're just magnificent. This is what I want. And you know uh, we've had some in front of the arboretum die. We, we try to replace them, and they never the replacements never grow. They just they they last a few years and then they peter out. They they're never able to sort of live up to and what their ancestors were able to do. And it took me a long time to realize that when Olmsted planted those trees, it was, the road was not paved. <laughs> and that's when those trees got established. And the pavement came after the trees were established. So these old specimen trees are actually anachronisms from a whole other era. But if you don't understand that, you know, you can't, it would be hard, you'd be hard pressed to rebuild this landscape given the current conditions. Um, same is true of the sycamores or the plane trees along Memorial Drive. I can't tell you how many times I've been, uh, people ask me what, you know, they're, they're dying and they want to replant them and they keep trying and they keep trying and the replacements never <laughs> do anything because it's the same thing. They got established before Memorial Drive was, uh, you know, was paved. And on the right hand side, that's, uh, New York City, that's right in front of the museum or on the side, I should say, the Museum of Natural History in New York. And you can see those trees have done really well. Uh, they're not nearly as old as the one in Cambridge, but because they're planted with a lot more uh, soil into that lawn area, and they're very healthy. So this is where they were planted, and it was a good planting. And of course, the plane tree is the symbol of the whole the New York City Parks Department. So uh, plane tree, it's a hybrid species that is the, the iconic of New York City. And this raises one question that's really interesting because there's this idea that native trees are somehow better than non-native trees. And we have a native sycamore, uh, Platinus occidentalis, that is subject, it grows along riverbanks, it's subject to a fungus disease called anthracnose that causes it to lose all of its first set of leaves that it produces. And then it has to produce a second set of leaves uh, that are not nearly as vigorous as the first one. And it's, in its native habitat, looks fine. When you plant it, it's not a very satisfactory tree. Whereas the hybrid species, which is uh, Platinus orientalis times occidentalis, which emerged in Europe, is much more better adapted to urban conditions. So this idea that everybody has that native species are going to perform better than non-native species is something of a myth, particularly when you're talking about an urban situation or even you know a town like Concord where you've got a lot of paving and you know you have a lot of development and disturbance. Um, getting back to this issue of iconic trees, uh, this is of course a live oak draped with uh, Spanish moss in Tallahassee. And when you see those low branch live oaks, you, you know you're in uh, the deep southeast. And the cabbage palm, sable, sable palmetto, this is a native species in Charleston, um, South Carolina. And you know, when you're driving down from the north to get away from the, the winter, and you arrive in Charleston and you see these palm trees, you know that you're no longer in New England. And you know what they want you to do is stop in South Carolina. They don't want you to keep going to Florida, so that's why they have those palm trees there. So you don't have to go any further. Um, and in uh, I grew up in San Francisco, and it's always been a big issue. Of what you know? What, what, what how? Do, what's the iconic tree for the city of San Francisco? In much the same way that the fan palm is the iconic of Los Angeles, and. Uh, when they were develop, redeveloping Market Street in the 1960s and putting in the BART transportation, they had a lot of opportunities to plant trees, and they, uh, they hit upon this Canary Island date palm because they're super tough, and they create a, uh, an image that um, you know, they felt comfortable with. This is on Treasure Island in the Bay, built in the 1930s, and here in Las Vegas, where they're desperate to create some sort of identity for themselves. Those are the Canary Island date palms. Because palms 
they don't have perennial root systems, so you know they they don't have a you can when you dig up a palm, you don't hardly need any root ball at all, and you can just pick them up, tie them up, and put them wherever you want, and they will survive. So this is a uh, very important tree in the West because it'll survive under any wide variety of conditions. When I put this picture in, this is uh, the camphor tree, set among camphora. We can't grow that here, it's uh, evergreen. But I took that picture in China in 1989. <laughs> Boy, the streets of Nanjing don't look anything like this now. Uh, there's no more bicycles in China, it's all cars. And um, there's the same species of camphor tree growing in Beverly Hills, uh, you know, a totally different environment. And here's the same species grown in Cape Town in South Africa. So what's interesting is it's here's this one tree that, you know, it's an originally, it's an Asian species, but it's adaptable to um, a wide range of conditions. And, you know, it does best in sort of uh, Climates that are sort of dry in the summertime, a somewhat um, Mediterranean type climate. And, uh, you know, so this idea of, a, you know, we should only be growing native species, um, that is one thing that I think is it's one of the assumptions that a lot of people make. And it's like saying, you know, you should only, you know, if there's, you know, however many colors there are in the color wheel. Well, I'm going to, you know, do a painting, but I'm only going to use two colors. I mean, there are so many incredible trees out there. Some of them are problematic, and I'm not advocating that you should plant anything that's problematic. But there are so many great trees that are not problematic and that are really well adapted to our conditions. We need to diversify our tree planting, and that's an insurance policy against future unpredictable changes. I mean, we're seeing that now. Our native flora is really under assault from climate change. And climate change is only going to get worse. So this idea that native plants are you know, best adapted to conditions that used to exist, that's true. But those conditions are gone. And we have to think about the future, not the past. And that's really what my message here is today, is we've got to think realistically about what is going to be happening in the future and what are we going to do with it. Because you don't want to put all this time and energy into planting trees only to have them die in 20 years. So that list that Brian referred to that's in there, those are the trees that, you know, based on my experience, I think are, you know, are adaptable. They can tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions. So those are the ones that I think that, uh, you know, it's not to say exclusively you should plant, but these are the ones that you know, are capable of doing the heavy lifting when it comes to street tree planting. Now, everybody talks about uh, ecological services in, in the, this day and age, um, mitigating climate change by absorbing CO2, but in an urban or even a town context like you have here in Con Concord, um, what trees also do is they and perhaps more importantly than absorbing CO2, is they make the city more livable by creating shade, by lowering temperature, and by, uh, you know, just aesthetic reasons for sure. And, you know, they provide animals, all animals, with food and shelter. They prevent erosion on slopes, stabilizing stream, lake, and river beds, improving air quality by trapping particulate matter, improving water quality, storm water infiltration, reducing temperatures. I think in the urban areas now people, have, this is perhaps the main thing that trees are doing and improve people's mental and physical health um, and improve urban aesthetics. <laughs> you know, and, that, and that's always getting shortchanged. People don't like to talk about aesthetics because, you know, that's just, there are all these other things, but in fact, in a city, aesthetics are really important. But I'd be remiss if I didn't also talk about the fact that trees uh, can also have some disservices, uh, such as lifting sidewalks, some of you may be familiar, clogging sewage drains, damaging foundations, 
taking down power lines and damaging property during storms, causing allergies, dropping branches, and growing where they're not wanted. So this is where the siting of the tree becomes really important so as you minimize the disservices. So when you plant trees, you want to maximize the services that they're providing. But if you put the tree in the wrong place, you're going to get <laughs> disservices. And these are real things that cost real money. Uh, my uh, wife's family has a house in the Berkshires. And the, the tree crews are out there every day of the year trimming back the trees so they don't take down the power lines. I can't imagine how much money it's cost to do that, you know, essentially across the whole state. So this is, you know, now those, a lot of those trees were not planted, so it's not really the same, but I think in an urban area, you really have to be aware of the fact that it's not all, you know, sweetness and light when it comes to trees, but there are some problems, and you really need to work hard to make sure that you don't cause problems by planting trees. A few examples. Um, uh, some, some incredible tree planting. This is in Tokyo. This is the uh, art museum, and this is a quadruple row of ginkgo trees that goes on for about oh half a mile, planted in the 1920s, and all pruned to that incredible shape to create it. And I was there in um, oh it's the end of November when they were having a festival, and people were coming out. You all know about Sakura, where they go and look at the cherry blossoms. Well, they, in the fall, the Japanese love the ginkgo tree, and they have a festival to celebrate the turning of the foliage of these ginkgo trees. It was quite remarkable. And, you know, what's the secret of this uh, tree care in Japan? There it is. Can you imagine doing that in America? A guy on a ladder with a hand pruning shears, <laughs> hand pruning trees. Well, this is how they, you know, make sure that the trees don't get too big and cause a lot of problems. But this is a very expensive solution, but the Japanese are willing to pay the price to keep the environment looking the way they want it to. And in, in opposition, this is the way ginkgo trees look in New York City. Uh, they're beautiful, but they're somewhat, uh, <laughs> like the Japanese would say, they need a haircut. Um, you know, so the basic question, what makes a good street tree? Good form, a tree with what's called excurrent growth, where the leader outgrows the lateral branches to produce a tree with a dominant central trunk. And make sure to avoid root suckering species, uh, like the black locust, because if something happens to the main trunk, then you get a thicket of stems replacing it, and that's a really inappropriate sort of uh, shape for uh, in, in an urban environment. Native versus non-native, one hears a lot about using native trees for street planting as though the urban street is a native habitat and native trees outperform non-natives. The big issue with street trees is survival under the existing conditions on the street, including pests and pathogens. And a lot of our native species now are subject to an incredible array of pests and pathogens. If you know anything about trees, the emerald ash borer is now wiping out all of our ash trees. The hemlock tree is in danger. And these, these and there's, there's more pests in the uh, offing that are coming. So we really have to think about that. Um, it's, the critical thing is nothing is native to the city. And all trees support wildlife. This idea that only native species support wildlife, that is true to a certain extent, but that is so over-exaggerated in the literature. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, think about migrating birds and what they have to eat when they travel from North America to South America. They eat whatever fruit they can find. You know, they need calories. They're not, uh, you know, oh, it's not native, I'm not going to eat it. You know, <laughs> if it's got carbohydrates in it, they're going to eat it because they need the carbohydrates. Animals are not stupid. Okay? Um, Bottomland versus upland. River corridors and floodplains provide highly disturbed, highlight habitats characterized by fluctuating water levels and heavy soils. The trees that grow there are pre-adapted to do well on urban streets where soil is compacted and low in oxygen. Examples of native bottomland species that grow well as street trees include silver and red maple, 
river birch, green nash, honey locust, sweet gum, pin and willow oak, bald cypress, plain tree, and the once ubiquitous American elm. So upland species like the sugar maple, a lot of the oaks, and the hickories, they don't do so well in the urban environment. It's too hot and it's too dry for many of them. And of course, we use a lot of salt on our roads, and a lot of those upland species, they don't like salt. So, you know, you got to get our, our, our most of our street trees come from bottomland habitats. The other thing is that hybrid trees typically outperform their parents in what are called novel ecosystems. The parents are adapted to native habitats, but the hybrid between two species is not adapted to anything, and so they actually do better than either of their parents uh, when you put them in a, in a novel ecosystem like a, like a city. Many hybrid species have been selected for superior performance of street trees, including, as I mentioned, the London plane tree and the saucer magnolia. Hybrid poplars, elms, use cherries and crab apples. All of our cherries and crab apples are hybrids. Okay, and hybrids are one of the things that is, you know, they're not, because they're not adapted to anything, that means that they're adapted to everything and that they can. You know, they've got a better shot at dealing with climate change than either of their parents in many cases. Um, now, looking a little bit at the history of street trees, you know, in Europe, <laughs> those narrow streets. Street trees, there are no street trees, okay? You know, there's Florence, there's trees in the surrounding hills, but in the city of Florence itself, unless you happen to have a large courtyard uh, where they'll put a tree in the middle of the courtyard, there are no, there's no such thing as street trees in the European uh, tradition. That came much later, uh, mainly in Paris, when they were redoing Paris in the uh, 1800s. And I, here's, I found this one example along the Seine. Here was this tree that was lined with poplars, and I thought, that's interesting. I haven't seen that before. And then I crossed the bridge, and I noticed the poplars were planted along the river, and they were just sort of functioning as street trees. So this is sort of, they were borrowed as street trees, but they're not really planted as street trees. So this is a clever way of uh, getting street trees when you don't really have the room. Now, in Boston, where there's a, it's become a social justice issue about which neighborhoods have more shade and, uh, than others, and it's tied to uh, economics and so on and so forth. But if you go to those parts of Boston that do not have a lot of street trees, such as Chinatown or East Boston, what you realize is there is no room for street trees. You would have to rip up that, <laughs> that entire sidewalk and the adjacent parts of the street and all the curbs in order to, there's so much infrastructure in that area that these neighborhoods were designed specifically to hold, to be really dense, to put as many people as possible in as small an area as possible. And the, and the idea that there are no street trees in there, well, that was the way it was designed. And so to put street trees back in this type of environment is really a super expensive operation and not at all biologically easy because you've got all this, you don't have any soil to speak of. It's all basically cement. So I would agree there is a social justice here, issue here, but you know, how do you actually deal with it? That's a much more complicated than people want to admit. So the pipe despite preconceptions about how stressful urban environments can be, roughly 25% of Boston surface area is covered by them. And you can see they're all the way down in Hyde Park, basically. Uh, and you know, parts of um, Alston and you know, Jamaica Plain. And um, between 2006 and 2014, researchers at Boston University, actually my good friend Lucy Hutira, who was just awarded a uh, MacArthur Grant, the first urban ecologist to whom that's ever happened, compared the growth of red oaks and red maples in Boston with those of the Harvard Forest, which is, you know, out in Petersham, Massachusetts. They determined that urban trees had higher growth rates than rural trees, but they also had higher mortality rates. And she summed it up as saying, live fast and die young. That's the fate of many urban trees. And here's the data. You can see that uh, you know that uh, the uh, for the rural on the top there, the uh, growth was 0.21 centimeters per year, whereas in the urban area, 
um, 0.78, almost four times as much, whereas the mortality rate for the, the urban trees was, um, you know, percentage of stems per year, 1.4 trees per year were dying um, in rural areas, whereas it was 3.06 in, uh, in the urban area. So, uh, and I promised Brian I'd show him a picture of the Liberty Tree in Boston Common. You see that one tree, right? Right there. That was the only tree left in the Boston Common after they cut them all down and used it for patch. That was, it's also called the hanging tree. <laughs> this is where anybody who was misbehaving could be taken home. But this is where, during the revolution, uh, people collected, you know, gathered underneath that point. And this is, of course, they used the common for uh, troops and uh, getting people together. And there's a plaque in Boston Common, if you know, if you look for it, where the, the, uh, the Liberty Tree used to stand, not too far from the, the powder house. This is, of course, what uh, Boston Common used to look like from an old postcard. American elms all the way, except in front of the State House, those are campestrous elms from Europe. But the rest of the column was all planted with American elms. And I borrowed this picture from Brian. This is downtown Concord in 1902. So the whole issue of street trees uh, was simple. It was just American elm. Simple answer. And it was because American elm, they grow in wetland areas. They're easy to dig up. You transplant them. You can prune them to your heart's content. And they'll just come right back. It's an incredibly vigorous tree that could be counted on. And you know, this is the way that street tree planting used to be. This is the Blue Hill Parkway in the 1920s. And the reason that one of the things about American Elms, why people, you know, it was so popular, and you see also sorts of painting with these sort of rural areas where you have beautiful American Elms in this agricultural landscape. It's a, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to split American Elm wood. <laughs> Raise your hand if you tried to split it. <laughs> the wood is, is no good at all. You cannot split it. It's got a twisted grain. And so people left the American elm, not because they had this wonderful sense of aesthetics, oh, these are beautiful trees, I don't want to take them down. It's that they were useless. You can't make lumber out of them. You can't even use them for firewood. So uh, that's how it became sort of the default tree uh, for New England, because it was ubiquitous and easy to transplant. And it is a magnificent tree. These are some ancient specimens that have managed to escape, at least for a while, Dutch elm disease. But uh, you can see why you know, people really uh, sort of admire the American elm. But you know, we've sort of forgotten that the American elm is a very vigorous and aggressive tree. It's got an amazing root system. If you have an American elm in your yard, that's your entire garden. Okay, nothing grows into the American elm. It is the, one of the best sidewalk lifters of all time. And that's a picture I took of the Arboretum. That's our propagator, Jack Alexander. And where his hand is, that's where the season started. And that's how much it grew in a single season. So that gives you some idea why people love the, the American elm. But of course, Dutch elm disease uh, emerged in the late 1920s and the 30s and by the 50s and 60s that it killed the vast majority of trees, street trees in New England. And the big decision facing horticulturists at the time is, what are we going to replace it with? And, you know, after trial and error, basically, they came up with the Norway maple. It wasn't as big as the um, American elm, which is a good thing. Uh, remember, this was happening as the suburbs were expanding, and so, uh, the car was becoming much more popular. And the other thing about the American elm, I mean about the Norway maple, is it was tolerant of salt. And so they wanted to, you know, particularly along the street, they wanted a species that could tolerate salt. And the thing about salt is we don't, you know, we don't want to, nobody wants to compromise public safety for the sake of a few trees. But it's, in fact, salt has a profound impact on the soil environment in which the trees are growing. It increases soil compaction, decreases water availability, that's called osmotic drought, interferes with cation exchange, it makes it hard for plants to pick up nutrients, and it elevates soil pH. So this is why sugar maples don't do well 
in the urban environment is this is because of, mainly because of these salt effects. And now temperature is you can add that and that put those together and you know so if you have a just the right kind of habits micro habitat you might be able to you know cultivate a sugar maple. But as a street tree, uh, it's a really, really bad choice. Um, and of course, beginning about, uh, I'd say, 40 or 50 years after Norway maple began being planted by the thousands, uh, lo and behold, people started noticing it in the adjacent woodlands and Norway maple uh, going wild. So it, it was, became an invasive species. Uh, Un, nobody really anticipated this, but that is what happened. And by the 1990s, people started complaining about the Norway maple. Uh, another, you know, this whole issue of what are we going to replace the American elm with has been a, an issue that horticulturists have struggled with for decades. And one of the species that was recommended was the Zelkova tree, which looks like an American elm, but it's like a miniature version of the American elm. But it's actually a good tree in its own right. It doesn't have the stature of the American elm, so it's not actually a good replacement for the American elm. But it is a great tree, but lo and behold, those are some mature Zelkovas in Watertown, and what do you think that hedge in the background is? <laughs> those are seedling Zelkovas. So, you know, starting about, I don't know, 15 years ago, I started noticing seedling Zelkovas all wherever there had been, you know, a mature Zelkova. So, you know, there's this, this, this adage, you know, right tree in the right place. And the fact of the matter is when you get the right tree in the right place, it starts to reproduce. <laughs> so this is trees doing what they're supposed to do. The idea that, oh my God, it's an invasive species. Well, this is, this is uh, that means you, you did a good job planting it because it's now behaving, uh, it's adapted to that particular environment. Another example of this is the Bradford pear, which it, you know was introduced in the was collected in China in the 19 teens, and then after you know decades of experimentation at botanical gardens, the U.S. National Arboretum uh, selected a specimen called Bradford and actually began propagating it and did an experimental planting in Maryland. I've seen the original planting of it; the trees are spectacular. And this became the perfect street tree. It blooms, you know, under all sorts of conditions. It grows well in California, it grows well in Boston, and it doesn't get too big, and so on and so forth. And uh, lo and behold, <laughs> this has become an incredible invasive species. It was first I noticed it in the mid-Atlantic region, but now I'm starting to see calorie pear tree reproducing spontaneously in the Boston area. That's climate change. As, as the weather changes, things get warmer, things get drier, whatever, uh, this species is adapted to it. So these really tough trees, uh, you know, one of the things about them is that they can, you know, they're very, very adaptable. So this is now on the invasive species list, like the uh, Massachusetts invasive species, like Norway maple. So it's a bigger crime now in Massachusetts to, you know, what do you say? Possession with intent to distribute calorie pear tree is a more serious crime than cannabis now. So I never thought I'd live to see that day, but uh, that is where we're at now. So, and then these are really problematic. And this is a, from Mount Auburn Cemetery, the tower of Mount Auburn Cemetery. If we've learned anything from the horticultural decisions of the past, it's an overplanting. So all those sort of chartreuse trees of their own Norway maples in bloom. Overplanting a single species is never a good idea. A diversity of well-adapted species, including both native and non-native, is key to a sustainable urban landscape. Enough already with the Norway maples. Um, an example again in Harvard Yard where I worked on replanting that area. The elms were all replaced, uh, this is before my time, with honey locusts, and then we added, I added yellow woods, oaks, and red maples, and we've got a nice, this is Tercentenary Theater where the commencement takes place, and we've created a, you know, it used to be all elms, and now it's actually a really nice, diverse uh, combination of four different species, and they really create that same canopy effect that people love so much. 
The first screen tree in the New England area was uh, a tree we don't ever see much anymore, was the uh, Lombardy Poplar. And this is uh, along the Muddy River, uh, Olmsted's planting uh, from 1895. So this was uh, the most popular street tree. And if you know anything about the Lombardy Poplar, it root suckers, it falls over, it gets all sorts of pests and diseases. It's not a great tree. Um, so we don't, you don't plant that anymore. But the other tree that uh, was really important is the uh, Ilanthus tree. In the 1820s, this was, you know, before there were a lot of street trees, uh, you know, people wanted street trees, and basically these specimens, on the, these are mature Ilanthus trees that you seldom see anymore. That's the one is in Pennsylvania. The other one was on the BU campus. That's my wife standing next to it. It's actually quite a spectacular tree introduced by Jesuits into, into France in the 1700s and then imported into the United States as a miracle tree that could survive anywhere. And then uh, people got a little disenchanted with the Ilanthus tree because it produces, it has a funny smell to it, produces pollen that they thought was causing you know, diseases in the water and stuff. So they, there was a thing, let's get rid of the uh, Ilanthus, and they started to cut it down, but whenever they cut it down, it root suckered. So those are not seedlings growing against that wall there, though that's where the root system of an old tree was, and they sprout up like that. So the Ilanthus tree, despite everybody's effort to get rid of it, <laughs> it just keeps coming back. So it's now the most common street tree in New York City, although it's not counted because nobody planted it. Yet it is probably doing more for the city than just about any other species of tree because it's so abundant. I love this picture. That was, that was an Ilanthus. It was not planted when I took that in 1910. There was an Ilanthus on the other side of the fence, but a root grew into this abandoned where a tree had died, and it took over that tree pit. <laughs> and you can see 10 years later, I took the picture again. It's actually a pretty nice street tree. Most people don't realize that there's an Ilanthus has taken it over. And, um, you know, so they're getting now to some of the nitty gritty, uh, and, and I know Concord has recently changed the bylaws to allow this to happen. That, you know, when you plant a tree along the, the, you know, in what's called the death strip between the, you know, the sidewalk and the street, they, they, that's a really stressful environment. And if you just move the tree over to the private property side of the, side, of the sidewalk, they have a much better chance of surviving if they have access to soil, nutrients, and water. So that is that, that idea of that, that strip between the sidewalk and the street is where the street trees belong. That's, that's left over from sort of, that's another anachronism from the horse and buggy era, basically. And with automobiles, that's not a great place to plant a tree because they don't really have enough room uh, to grow. And so one of the reasons I showed this picture earlier of the Commonwealth Avenue, those magnolias are doing so well because they're all planted in front yards. They're not planted next to the street. There's only one street tree there, and that's that big old American elm in the background. And, you know, but even when you do it right, in this case, this is uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Those are liriodendron trees, tulip trees, and they planted them on the private property side of the, the sidewalk. But actually, that species is too big to be a street tree. So it really causes huge problems. So even when you do it right, you still have to select a tree that is going to be appropriate in size over time for the location that you're putting it into. Um, and of course, ghost trees uh, haunt the streets of Boston. And if you pay attention, you, you see that, you know, I don't know, about a quarter of the trees that are planted, uh, this is the way they look, you know, 10 or 15 years later. The black hole, is what my students call it. Um, and the, the city is full of these trees. Um, and, and tree grapes that are super expensive, uh, are, they typically cause more problems than anything else. It's again, this is left over from another era. This is just not a great way to manage street trees. And then there's the question of the tree grade, and you know, th th this is how you should be planting trees, and look at what it is, it's confining it. And you see there's a ghost tree with a, a ghost grate around it there. But the really funny thing about it, this is from a book, uh, 1903, 
about where this idea of the tree break came from. The necessity for some protection is readily apparent on examining trees from the curbstone side and observing a large number of which the bark has been gnawed by horses. <laughs> the whole point of the tree guard was to protect the tree from horses. They serve no function whatsoever, in, except maybe you can tie your bicycle to it, you change your bicycle to it, but that's about it. And yet we still keep putting tree guards up, and they're, they're incredibly expensive with these tree guards that are completely, you know, on the, on the bottom, useless. So this is a, you know, we're just stuck in, in this very, some very bad uh, behavior. Yes, those are pictures of trees being gnawed by horses. So now you understand why we have to have tree guards. Um, another thing, you know, this is a water town, I'm embarrassed to admit, where, you know, they, they have a lot of street trees, and then the, the street trees died, and instead of uh, you know, doing it right, they, they just paved over it. Of course, there's no curbs there, because they're too cheap to put the replace the curbs there. And so people are always parking just a little bit off the road onto the sidewalk side, where the tree planting area is. So curbs, yes, they're expensive. I completely agree with that. But if you want to have street trees, you've got to protect them from the cars. That is really, really important. And if you don't do it, um, this is just what you're going to end up with. And this is a picture. I took this in Belmont. Um, you know, this was what a scene without curves. And of course, there were no street trees on it. But then they finally redid it. And they redid it the right way. So they created a not individual tree pits, but they connected the pits so that all the trees can share a, a large soil volume. So OK, if you're going to use that death strip for planting, at least connect uh, all of the tree pits. It, you know, I told my students, if I ever catch any of you, you know, designing and implementing uh, planting trees in a meter square tree pit, you know, I, I'm going to go back and I'm going to change your grade uh, that I gave you in your class. Because that, is, that meter square tree pit, it's just, you know, trees under those conditions tend to live about 10 to 15 years, and then they run out of soil, essentially. So, Connecting them is a really critical thing. And you can see here, it's just some examples. The one on the right, I took that picture in Korea. And you can see that those trees, scholars' trees, are going to last a long time because the planting was done correctly. And this is in front of the arboretum. <laughs> Look at how much room they gave. Well, that's another reason why those red oaks did so well. Look at That's a 12-foot wide planting strip, and it's all connected. The thing is, if you want trees to grow, you've got to give them room. And this is one of the problems. You can't, if you leave it up to the developers, that's real estate that they can, you know, make money from. They don't want to give any real estate to the trees unless they're forced to by the town. So, you know, trees need room. And if you don't give it to them, they're not going to survive. So these are some examples. This is the uh, VFW Parkway. These are... Uh, in near the arbor, and these are pin oaks, and it just, you know, that was planted in the, I mean, that was designed in the 1930s, and it just, those trees were planted then, and they've just done remarkably well. This is another way of doing it, but again, what defines these pictures are the soil volume, and this is in uh, Spain, those are plain trees, and, you know, it's just a totally different way of designing and putting, giving the trees what it is they need to survive. And this is something with parking lots. This is the whole new way of designing parking lots so that you can, they can trap water so that there's no runoff from it. And then you use that as a river perches that um, are very tolerant of wet soils. And so you've got uh, you know, dual functionality here. You've got beautiful trees growing, and they're helping with water, stormwater management. And because they're all connected, that means those trees are going to do very well. This is the old style the parking lot islands that um, is no longer appropriate because they can't contribute anything to stormwater runoff and they, they've got a very small, relatively small soil volume to work with and so they may live for 20 years or so but then eventually uh, they're, you know, they're completely surrounded by a sea of pavement, they're not going to make it. And a big issue now that a lot of cities are facing is Infrastructure, how do you plant trees on top of infrastructure? Because that's, that's where the 
some of the available spaces. So if you put enough resources into it, you can grow trees on top of urban infrastructure. But this is the big dig. But it's a huge uh, undertaking and very expensive. And it has to be built into the process right from the beginning. And this is uh, part of the big dig. And you might have heard, when I was growing up, my mother always used to talk about the $5 tree and a $10 hole which is to get me to keep digging in a wider hole. But now, for planting a street tree in, in a city, it's more like a $500 tree and a $10,000 hole. To actually, the infrastructure necessary to drain and support that tree is enormous. To say nothing of that metal rail. And so, adequate soil volume is really the key to uh, tree longevity, and, but it can be a real problem when you have a lot of paving and infrastructure to deal with. And there are several novel ways of dealing with this, one of which is called the structural soils, where you essentially, underneath the, the volume taken up by the sidewalk, you put the, this um, matrix in that's mostly gravel, but it has 10% of uh, loam in it and a few other things in it, and uh, just enough to allow the tree to roots to grow in there, and that makes the sidewalk um, space available to the tree. And because it's gravel, you can compact it so it will support the cement. But this is, you have to do this from the beginning. It's a more expensive than the traditional way of building a sidewalk, but it really supports the, uh, the growth of trees over the long haul. Or you can actually create these, um, uh, use these plastic supports. They're like industrial grade plastic that supports the sidewalk and then you fill the, the space that they create with loam. And uh, those trees do very well, but this is a very expensive way to do it. Uh, and if you, you know, in an intense urban development where you've got a lot of money available and you want trees, this is how you do it. So the idea of digging a hole and putting a tree in it, it's just not how it's done uh, anymore, uh, particularly in the urban environment. The best example is um, the Ground Zero uh, monument in New York, where they planted over 400 swamp white oaks. So, you know, this idea of these flying trees is sort of interesting. And that's what it looks like, Ground Zero. And the infrastructure underneath that supports them is unbelievable. The soil, uh, chambers and the water chambers to keep it all irrigated and so this is a you know multi-million dollar project to put those trees there and it's kind of uh i always laugh at it because this is a swamp white oak this is what a swamp white oak if you let it grow on its own will do this is i consider this the most beautiful tree in boston this is along the money river near where the used to be called the sears tower i think it's called the landmark center now but it is just a magnificent tree. So if you can imagine 400 of these in ground zero. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it actually makes a very good urban tree, but it needs, you know, over time, a lot of room. So it'll be interesting to watch how those uh, swamp white oaks do at the ground zero uh, memorial. Trees and wires, uh, I don't have to tell you anything about that. Uh, that's my first commandment when planting a tree is uh, look up, and if you see any wires, don't plant the tree there. Uh, you've all seen the donut tree. And of course, Concord, how many people remember the tornado? I took this picture from the Boston Globe. Uh, this is one of the disservices provided by trees. And Concord, actually, shortly after this, made the decision to put all their wires underground, like begin the process of putting the wires underground, which is really the ultimate solution to this problem. So that kudos to Concord for, it's not a cheap process, but that is really the only way if you want trees, and you have a lot of wires there, you kind of have to put those wires underground. And, um, you know, you could use the Chinese style, which is to prune them, because you've got a lot of people doing the pruning. Or <laughs> in Cuba, I love this picture. This is a bus stop, as well as a, the tree is pruned and do, do not interfere with the wires. And of course, you can select a species that is low branch, that won't interfere with the wires, but these species 
that's fine in the front yard, but it doesn't work so well on the street because they're so low branched. And of course, one of the things that's amazing about New York City, I remember when I moved east, you know, what is it about these streets in New York that's so amazing? And, you know, I, I couldn't figure it out. I don't know, there's no wires in New York City. <laughs> it's really amazing. All the wires are underground. And that explains why there's so many trees in New York City and why they're doing so well, despite the fact that they don't have a lot of soil to work with. So, you know, getting those wires completely out of the, the way is the ultimate solution to that issue. And I wanted to say, ending now with a few, um, if you have enough room, I'm a big advocate for what I call grove planting, and which is the same species and a number of specimens. So you want trees that are sort of nice and vertical um, in their orientation with a nice strong central leader. And I'm going to show you some pictures of good, what I consider good grove planting, because I think that you might have some opportunities for that here in Concord. This is the dawn redwood, metasequoia, in its fall color, and then its winter form is beautiful. And of course, the red oaks in Central Park. Uh, this is just an amazing plantation of red oaks. Yes, it's not very diverse, but you know, there's a lot of diversity throughout the rest of the park. So the fact that they have one area where it's mostly red oak, that doesn't bother me at all. Or even this isn't really a grove, but these are red maples planted in such a way as they really create a, a, a very compelling feeling for my favorite, the ginkgo tree at the Yama Barbarita. And this is a grove I planted over there. And when they're all in color like this, you just can't beat that. And of course, some trees, like you think the bald cypress, which grows naturally in the southeast and forms dense groves on its own, is actually a very good urban tree. And here's a grove of bald cypress in Tokyo, of all places. And this is, it turns out it's actually a good street tree because, as I said, it's a bottomland species and they typically do very well in urban areas. So with climate change, uh, bald cypress is now one of the trees I really recommend for uh, tree planting. Not necessarily on the street, but certainly in a park or front yard. It's a fabulous tree and uh, it's very well adapted to changing climates. And I love this uh, grove in Tuscany, and I took this picture just because it was an interesting grove, and then I looked at it, and I, and I blew it up on my computer, and it turns out there's a cemetery underneath all those trees. That's why they were preserved. So this is a sacred grove. So this is the thing about groves, is they're often associated, they have a deeper meaning to people, and they're used for very different purposes. So that was preserved because that was a, uh, an old cemetery. And of course, Robinia is a root suckering species, so that's another way to get a grove. Uh, you see these all along Route 2 as you drive either east or west. So the take home message is growing trees along streets has more to do with horticulture than ecology. Okay, trying to make everything ecological. No, you know, this is about how do you grow trees? How do you make sure they're going to live? That's not an ecological issue. This is good horticulture. Uh, select species based on their ability to tolerate existing site conditions rather than on where they come from. Nothing is native to the city. Climate change and increased pressure from introduced pests and pathogens has dramatically shortened the list of reliable street trees. We need a diverse array of urban adapted species that can cope with an unpredictable future. Trees need adequate soil volume to survive. Make sure planting areas are as big as you can and connect them when possible. And it's better to plant 500 well-maintained trees. I should have made that 250 well-maintained <laughs> trees than 1,000 that one doesn't take care of. Trees need to grow for 10 to 20 years before they provide any significant ecological services, but they won't survive this long if you don't care for them when they're young. Always purchase the two-year guarantee from the nursery. And soil compaction is the big killer of trees. Do everything possible to keep people and cars off the tree root zone. Give me drainage or give me death. And uh, with that, that's my last slide. So.
Lucy and I live on Elm Street, and there wasn't a single elm on Elm Street. So our neighbor and, and I planted, planted elms, and all of you were invited to come have drinks in 50 years and see how <laughs> uh, Do we have any questions for Peter Del Travis? Yes, sir. I didn't see a lot of evergreen trees in the slides. Any comments on evergreens? Well, uh, you know, some of you might be familiar with the white pine, which is a great, you know, iconic tree for New England. And I planted a lot of white pines. I don't know if you remember, there was an, uh, a Halloween storm about, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. And um, <laughs> I thought I would never plant another white pine as long as I live. The amount of damage that they can take from winter ice storms. I think they're fine for parks and woodlands and stuff like that, but not, I don't recommend them for, you know, front yard trees. They get really, really big, and they're great trees, but they're not good urban trees. Uh, they drop a lot of sap. Does anybody have that issue in their yard? And, uh, you know, so I would really try to focus on trees that I recommend for planting. In terms of evergreens, I, I do, I, it was sort of simplified by this. I put some evergreens on the, uh, the list, but they don't make great street trees uh, because of they, they need more organic matter in the soil. And there's some Camisiparis, there's the, you know, the Arborvitae, the Thuya. But again, those are more front yard trees or the yew bushes, you know, uh, those are, so that I just, in the interest of keeping this short, and uh, I, I didn't put a lot of everything but there are a lot of good evergreens. Uh, the Taxodium, remember, it's a deciduous evergreen. The Dawn Redwood is a deciduous evergreen. One of the things about trees that are, the evergreens that are deciduous, that makes them more adaptable to climate change because they just keep growing until the weather gets cold. And then, you know, when the weather gets cold, they just lose their leaves. Uh, so they can, you know, if it's a, they're, they're it's just much more adaptable in many ways. So the deciduous conifers are actually uh, pretty good urban trees in general. Before I just a minute, before I um, spread the questions around, uh, I want to hand out down the aisle um, uh, an opportunity for you to support the 250 tree initiative because we have to apply, among other places, to the community preservation uh, group, and they need to know. Is anybody in town interested in the initiative? So if you do this, uh, it'll never be published. <laughs> and we had a question on the aisle over there. Uh, this is it a street tree question is coming that's off topic. I'm curious what you've seen in terms of leading edge uh, practice with respect to uh, replacement of trees that developers cut down. I think in Concord, if it's not in a wetland, you can cut anything down in the air. And I just, it, it, it seems in the same vein as your, your guards around the trees for horses. Um, the, the sort of ordinance we have or don't have on, on what you do if you cut down X tons of, of tree and under your ground. What have you seen advanced places do? Well, this is where politics you know, rears its ugly head. And, um, you know, I think that the, um, What's really hard for developers to do, and I've worked on some sites, like the site in Watson, where the old Watson State Hospital used to be, which is grown up and it's got some magnificent, in particular, swamp white oaks. And I worked with the developer to try and preserve what are the trees here that are worth preserving, what are the trees that you just you know, really are on the way out and you can just get rid of them. And they, they made a good faith effort to try and do this. But then, when you look at the final project, it was really disappointing because it's really, really hard for developers not to want to maximize the commercial square footage. And you see this in parking lots as well. So I think that, uh, you know, in, in many ways, the towns have to really be, you know, they have to say to the but they have to tell them, you know, the developers what they want. You know, it's not leave it up. You can't leave it up to the developer. That's all I can say. The city of Cambridge is a good example. They really have invested tremendous resources in their street trees, and they do an incredible job. Whereas a place like Watertown, 
which is just undergoing an incredible development now, the whole biotech firm and stuff like that. It's like they, they make an attempt to, you know, tell the developers what to do, but it's nothing. You, you just, they just don't. They'll do the minimum. Let's put it that way. So I hope there's no developers in the audience. But, you know, it, it, it's real estate. And that real estate is worth money. And the, the, the trees are not going to pay rent. So, you know, it's, it's only if you can convince them that having the trees here will increase the property values that they are willing to do it. Or they'll do it if they have to, in order to do that project. That's my basic experience. I don't know if anybody has a different one. It's not just the developers, it's the town, too. If you take up the parking lot that's uh, behind uh, Walden Street, and the design of that, and where trees are planted and how they're planted, it would be good if the town had some education on some of the things that you were talking about. Uh, Peter, I have a question. Um, can a town become an arboretum? And how would it go about doing that? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, a lot of college campuses are arboreta, and there's a, an organization that you have to meet certain standards in order to be you know, to qualify as an arboreta to a lot of um, retirement communities. And that's how they sort of get the, the residents involved in this whole process of tree planting and then beautification. So it can be done, but um, it, it really is a, and so you have to have good records and you have to be able to track, you know, all, every, all the maintenance that you do to it and stuff like that. But the goal is really, you know, to plant more trees. And that sometimes is, is at odds with the goals that the town may have. So I think the key is to identify certain areas where you can intensify the tree planting and not, you know, make it, you know, the whole, not, not treat the whole town as a, as a unified you know. Well, like schools would be a good place to plant many forests. Do you have a comment about the Yakuwa forests? Well, I don't have any personal experience with that, and I, I think that um, the problem with schools, I don't know about Concord, but they got so much pa pavement uh, that it's really hard to, you know, keep that parking and deal with the pavement. But I. So to do a mini forest, you need a, a good area to do that because you have to plant the canopy trees, the shrub layer, and the herb layer. So it's a whole forest you're planting. You're not just planting a single tree. Whereas if you just plant individual trees or groves of trees, I think that you know people are attached to the idea of a forest. But I think groves actually are pretty interesting. And the other thing about trees and education, I think it's really important, is you can use that as part of the curriculum. So that th then this tree is the trees that are planted are then integrated into the biology curriculum. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And then the city of Boston had a whole program for schoolyard planting for, for many, many years. But then the issue is that everybody leaves at the end of June. And who's going to care for it in July, August, you know, June, July, and August, basically? And some of these trees need some, you know, a little watering and stuff like that. So if the town is in charge of it, then that would solve the problem, as opposed to the custodian at the school. That, that's one of the, that's what happened in Boston, is the school custodian became responsible for taking care of the trees. And the custodian didn't like the fact that they got this extra job added to their um, I'm, I'm looking around the room, I'm wondering whether uh, some of my friends, Henry, did you have a question? Or Neil in the back? No. Uh, Here's a young, the young gentleman right up here is a question. Oh, yes. I'm just wondering, like, you know, we've spoken about, you know, the Nori maple and how these kinds of trees go from a really great, you know, street tree and city tree to just something that's admittedly more of like a nuisance. And I, I'm personally more on the side of like native trees when it comes to native versus non-native, but I also understand that in these kinds of situations, you know, sometimes it's just like the best tree kind of gets the gets the take there. But might we might be having like a different conversation in a hundred years when you know the trees we plant today might uh, you know kind of strive out on their own. We might be like talking about ginkgo infestations, right? Well, I guarantee you, we will be having. Then we have no idea what's going to happen in a hundred years. We don't even know what's going to be happening in you know thirty years, basically. I mean. 
I started working in General Armory in 1979, which is just when climate change was beginning to, you could see it happen. You could begin to measure it actually happening. So that was, you know, 40 years ago. The amount of change in that period of time is dramatic. And what, you know, what people were saying about trees in 1980 versus what they're saying now, it's completely different. So I'm not pretending that I have the answer to what's going to be happening that some of the trees on my list aren't going to become problematic. Some of them might. But these are the trees that are not currently problematic and are adaptable enough that we can be pretty sure that they'll they'll live for you know a good 50 or 60 years. But predicting the future is really hard. And one of the things that's really hard to mention is, is pests and pathogens. They're, they're still coming into this country from all over the world. And you know the, the Emerald Ash Borer is you know a recent example, but that spotted lantern fly, which is in Pennsylvania, is now in Massachusetts. And you talk to any forester, they'll give you a whole long list of things that they're worried about. So how do you deal with this? And the um, one of the things is that the native species, because they didn't sort of evolve with these pests, are more susceptible in many ways than the non-native species, because they, they sort of evolved in isolation. The other thing you've got to realize, and this is, I didn't put any slides, is that all of New England was under ice 15,000 years ago. So all the trees that were here, you know, had to come up from down south, basically. And like the chestnut tree that's now gone because of a pathogen uh, that killed them all, basically, uh, that only arrived in New England a thousand years ago. So we tend to think about native as this permanent thing. But in fact, you know, the, the ecology of New England is only 15,000 years old. So we don't actually know. And I showed you that picture of the taxodium. It grows natively in a wet area, but that that's where it has the best competitive advantage. It can actually grow in a much wider range of habitats than where it's found in nature. People often make that mistake. They think where it grows in nature, you have to replicate that if you want to grow the tree. And that's one thing that you, if you go to the Arboretum, you'll see we grow trees way outside what their native habitat looks like because that's, that's what we do. We're always testing them. Peter, I have another young man. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, Richard. Two, two comments on the question. The first comment is an honor to, to hear you talk. You and I talked together for a few <laughs> years, and, and your enthusiasm is still here, and knowledge is, is wonderful. The second uh, comment is that we have in Concord one uh, bald cypress. It's about 120, 125 years old. Maybe you've seen it, I don't know. And with all the knees around it, so on and so forth. Uh, we should probably plant a bit. Uh, the the uh, question I had was, I, I have a third of an acre, and I've been planting trees and shrubs there for 30 years, I got that out in more like 40 years. And um, there were, I have 63 woody shrubs and trees in this third of an acre, species, sorry, species. And eight of them were there before I got there. So, I, you know, there's a, no, there's a sugar maple and a Norway maple and you and things like that. Uh, but I've planted mainly southern species. I wish you'd say something about that. I mean, it, partly it's, well, partly it's to attract the southern birds and insects that are coming anyway uh, to my place. Uh, but um, say something about uh, the, the idea of planting southern species. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's, it's and it goes to the heart of what's happening is that, we, you know, with climate change, uh, southern species are essentially migrating north, and northern species are leaving town. You know, a lot of the evergreens, like the spruces and the firs, they're, they're just not finding New England to their liking as much. So, bald cypress is a good, now that hasn't migrated here on itself, but if you plant it here, it's doing, it does really, really well. But one tree that is doing is the, the tulip poplar. I'm beginning to see tulip poplar all over, you know, uh, New England now. And it's, that used to be just very rare. Another example is the river birch, which, um, again, is a, the Mississippi Valley is huge specimens. And that is now, um, you know, it's becoming, I mean, it was planted, and now it's 
spreading on its own. And so planting seems to be, there's two things. One, one is you can plant it, and if enough people plant it, then it begins to move on its own. The other thing is to just let that species migrate on its own. And a lot of species are actually doing that. We're seeing that. And there's a word for that, which is an interesting thing. That's called a neo-native. And uh, we're seeing many, many more of those species now migrating up from the south. So the things are really changing. And uh, it's, it's pretty dramatic to, to see that. And what planting does is that you can speed that whole process up by planting. It's called assisted migration. And so there was a long article, and I think it was the New York Times, about trying to assist the migration of California redwoods up into Seattle. You know, by planting them. So, you know. Well, we have uh, time for at least one more comment, and I'd like to give it to my friend uh, Krista Collins, uh, who has the immense responsibility for the town to indicate where we might plant 250 trees. <laughs> <laughs> well, how would I have a, a, an army of volunteers helping? And so, yeah, Krista Collins, I'm a member of the Concord 250 Permanent Memorials Volunteer Group, and so we are subcommittee, and I also have Polly Reeve is here, and Tui, or Tui, go. Tui Rogers over there, who are also members of the subcommittee. And then I see Henry Moss is uh, among a group of volunteers that is also um, uh, helping out with the project. Did anyone else from the volunteer group? No. Um, so I want to thank you, Peter, so much for sharing all that, all that tree knowledge. Um, and, and for all of you who have signed the, um, the, the, I don't want to call it a petition, but the list that's going around that we'll share with the Community Preservation Committee to show that there is support for this. <laughs> Uh, proposal to plant 250 trees for the 250th. Um, every every time we've talked about it at one of our public forums or anywhere else, we haven't heard anyone say they don't like the idea of planting 250 trees. So that's great. Um, we are going to, um, you know, with um, respect to, to all that Peter shared with us about, you know, right tree, right place, and not a native species not always being the right choice for an urban environment. We are going to try to stick to trees that are native to New England for the um, for these 250 trees, and we've got good support from Public Works um, to help with that. Um, I, you know, I use my own street as an example in West Concord. It, it, it's lined with beautiful, um, stately um, silver maples, which is not always the greatest <laughs> street tree. They're beautiful, but then they, when they start to start to age, they have problems. But um, you know, as they come down, I see a lot of my neighbors replacing them with things like Kusa dogwoods. We have a lot of Kusa dogwoods on the street now. We have a lot of syringa trees. And so I think, you know, our effort is going to focus on the native trees because those are, those are the ones that we have control over. Private landowners are always going to plant what they want to plant in their yard. So finding that balance, finding that diversity, I think that's, that's the overall goal for, for tree planting in town. And we really hope that, you know, if we can make it to 250 trees, in one, in well, over the course of three planting seasons, um, that then maybe that sets the that sets a trend for the town because we do want to see the you know right now public works plants about 80 to 100 trees a year, but some trees come down. Usually when public works takes a tree down, it's because someone is worried that it's a it's a threat to to health and human safety. You know they got a lot of requests from homeowners to take street trees down. So um, so they're always trying to strike a balance too, but um, but we've got to kind of ramp it up if we want to keep up with, with the loss to pests and disease and as things change with, with climate change. So I want to thank you all so much. And thank you so much, Peter and Brian, for organizing this. And, um, I'll, my, I'll, I'll close with my favorite, my favorite saying, which is the best time to plant a tree was 50 years ago, and the second best time is today. <laughs> <laughs> with this idea of grove plantings. And I think that when you have that right site, and you can like that, that is a really, that's something that people find very compelling. And also, the, the trees support each other, and so you don't have these big, wide-spreading branches. So you tend to get less damage associated with the grove planting than you do with, in, when you grow a tree as an individual, it, it starts spreading out. And that predisposes them to the storm damage later on. So that's my only you know, practical suggestion for you. Peter, thank you. Uh, 
you so much. For all the birds in the audience, <laughs> we appreciate your coming to Calgary and hope you'll come back. All right. Well, thank you for inviting us.